Do you want to start a thriving real estate career, but don't know where and how to start? Do you want to become a successful realtor or investor, but lack the required knowledge and skills? Gear yourself up with the best and actionable advice here on The Real Estate Rundown. Tune in as Shannon Robnett talks with industry veterans about all kinds of asset classes, market trends, challenges, management techniques, and success stories. Listen to informative discussions with valuable tips that will serve as the foundation for your incredible real estate venture. Now, here's your host, Shannon Robnett. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Rundown. And, you know, our goal on this show is to help you guys get the most out of your real estate investing experience. And to do that today, I brought on a special guest, uh, a guy that just right down the road from us is helping people get their tax bills to zero. A gentleman by the name of Eric Oliver. Eric, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks. And I appreciate it. Glad to be here. You know, Eric, you are a cost segregation specialist and really, you know, everybody hears about this, this zero tax game, right? And, and we have a lot of investors that invest with us and their, their number one concern, uh, like we talked about before the show, is just getting to that zero tax mark. They don't, they don't want to pay taxes. Uh, nobody wants to pay taxes, right? I mean, if we want to help somebody, we'll give to a charity, right? But right. when you see what government does with our money, nobody wants to pay the tax bill. And so- Everybody hears about this, this, this thing, these, how do you get to a zero tax game and cost segregation is something that gets tossed around. And I think that there's really two schools of thought with cost segregation in the market right now. One is it's too hard to mess with. And the other one is we do it all the time, right? Uh, right. And we really want to help our listeners today get from the that seems difficult to, oh my gosh, I can't believe we haven't been doing this before. And maybe we should look at amending last year's taxes to make sure that we can take advantage of it for this year, right? right. So so tell us a little bit, I mean, you, you've got a background in applied science. I mean, you, you've got a bachelor's degree uh, you, you, in accounting. I mean, you, you tell us a little bit about your journey, about how you came to be a cost segregation expert and then let's jump into a couple of things about what cost segregation does and how it works for the average person. Sure. No, that's a, that's a great question. So um, how I became a cost segregation expert. So I got to be honest with you. When I started this career six years ago, I did not know what cost segregation was. So my background is it, <laughs> which a lot of people don't. Well, that, but that's how most experts are found, right? They fall into a hole and they, they, they learn their way out. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know if that's the right answer, but uh, <laughs> let me explain on that. So my degree is in accounting, as you'd mentioned. So numbers have always come easy. I, um, growing up in school and in college, I said, how am I going to get through this college thing as quick as I can? And I was either science or math, and I'm horrible at science. It takes me forever to write a research paper. So I'm like, math comes easy. I'm going to do finance or accounting. So math has always come fairly easy. And so I got my accounting degree. Didn't really have any interest in becoming a CPA. Um, actually ended up in sales, business development for a number of years, and had moved out to the East Coast um, and wanted to move back here to Salt Lake. And so um, was looking for jobs, came across one, always interested in real estate, um, read a lot of books, um, was always fascinated with the, the real estate market and how um, you can create long-term wealth with real estate. And then with my accounting background, I came across this job and I'm like, hey, this is kind of a niche accounting firm where they focus on real estate. And that's kind of how I got into it. Um, I've learned a ton about real estate over the last six years, ton about cost segregation, um, the business, the, the company that I work for, we've been around for 15 years. And so we've got a lot of experts here who understand real estate, who are all real estate investors themselves. And so cost segregation is really just, it's an underutilized tax planning tool that, like you said, until recently, there's been some tax change, tax law changes that have made it more um, accessible for all types of investors. It used to just be cost segregation was for your real large investors who are buying, you know, hospitals or large apartment complexes, casinos, but with some of the tax law changes, it's now um, more impactful for almost all investors. And so it's just something that we like to get out and educate people should be aware of. Well, and you know, I don't know why more people don't read the tax code. It's only 70,000 pages long, right? <laughs> right? Uh, and, and the tax code changes, I mean, those only happen, you know, every 20 years, right? I mean, they don't change anything. Uh, <laughs> So, but, you know, one of the things that I, I, I want to I stop and highlight, and this is, I think, I think the biggest 
miscommunication that people have when they think about accounting, right? Uh, people think my accountant's job is to save me tax money, you know, but accountants, they, they, they put stuff in boxes, right? They, they right. take the numbers. They, I mean, when you go most, most problem, uh, most people's problem is they go to meet with their accountant in February or March and there's nothing to do to change last year. Right. No, correct. And, and so they're, they're sitting there going, save me for myself. I did zero planning. Right. Right. Now, even if you're going on a road trip, I mean, you're going to do some planning, but it's amazing how many people do zero tax planning uh, and then they come to the end of the year. But why is it that that accountants, I'm asking, because yeah. I've never gotten a, a clear que- or a clear answer. Why is it that accountants don't do more education of their clientele during the year? Is it just... Sure, that's a, that's a great question. And I actually... Um, I met with a firm a few years ago and we presented to them and talked to them about cost segregation. They sent over a few deals and, but it was a, it was a massive firm. And I, I reached out to the guy and said, listen, I know you guys have hundreds of real estate clients. Like what's going on here? Um, you know, you've only, you've only reached out a couple of times but we can help your other, other real estate. And he said, listen, Eric, he goes, I've got 1400 tax returns that are due by April. And I've got nine IRS audit responses that are sitting on my desk. He yeah. goes, for me to sit and educate, and, and like you, you hit it on the head, we're motivated by what we're compensated for. So CPAs, oh, not all CPAs, <laughs> some CPAs are compensated to file your tax return. And that's, you, you know, they file your tax return, you pay them, that's how they make their money. So there's a big difference between a CPA and a tax planner or a tax yeah. strategist. Totally. So, yeah. CPAs are kind of, and I'll just throw this out. CPAs in general, are they're your general practitioners. And so they- right have to know a little bit about a whole wide array of subjects and they can't dive deep into real estate unless they've made that decision early on that, Hey, my firm is just going to be working with real estate clients and we're going to be the best at real estate. And so that's when they partner with outside companies um, to help provide that expertise in real estate. But um, you're exactly right. You want to make sure you've got a a tax strategist that understands real estate versus taking your return to H and R block at Walmart and having them. Yeah. Cause the only block that's going to get knocked is yours, right? You're going to get right. it knocked, you know, <laughs> but, and, and, you know, that's an amazing thing too. And, 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 you know, it's obvious that the marketing guys haven't talked with the accounting guys and the accounting guys have already done the numbers and realized that the marketing guys don't fit in their budget. Right. So right. <laughs> because the reality is if you came to any business owner or any person and said, Hey, I can improve your bottom line by 10%. Just ten percent, right. you'd have a line out the door of people that would say, "I need your service," right? Right. But but they don't, and it is up to the consumer or the investor to find that strategist, to find that person that does the things that you uh, hope that everybody does. But that's just a common misconception, and so your firm really just focuses on cost segregation, right? So that's Correct. your whole deep dive. Yeah, right? that's exactly right. So let's get into what, let's peel back the skin on what is cost segregation. I just bought a fourplex. What's, what's my cost segregation move here? Sure. So cost segregation, I'll just back it up just to one step. So a lot of us get into real estate for some of the tax benefits. That's not the only reason. There's obviously appreciation and there's a number of reasons we get into real estate, but one of the big benefits is the tax write-offs. And so um, when you purchase that fourplex, you're able to depreciate that over 27 and a half years. So residential property gets depreciated over 27 and a half years. Commercial and that half property. year is really the kicker that really, that's where that's all the one that puts it over the top. That's, the, right? that's where all the yeah. money. I still want to ask Congress who came up with that idea. So I don't understand. Yeah. The 27 yeah. And a half. yeah. You know, one guy was at 28 and the other guy was at 27 and they, <laughs> they finally said, fine, 27 and a half. I, 27 yeah. and a half. Let's get it signed. Yeah. So uh, residential property is 27 and a half, commercial property is 39 years. So just to make the math easy, let's say you bought that fourplex for 275,000. You'd be getting a $10,000 write-off every year for the next 27 and a half years, which is great. You know, you have, let's say you have 100,000 of income. Well, now, hold on, Eric, to be correct, we would need to have bought that for $350,000 with a $75,000 lot with $275,000, yes. right? Yes, I, I oversimplified. <laughs> yeah, I oversimplified. You, you don't get to depreciate land. So right. you're right. You right. Bought so it we bought it for three fifty. dollars We got a $75,000 land value with two seventy five dollars left. And now we're going to depreciate that. Now we're going to depreciate that. Correct. So you're going to get a $10,000 write-off every year for the next 27 and a half years. But 
Um, what if we don't own that property for 27 and a half years? I don't have plans on owning that property for 27 and a half years. How can we accelerate those deductions instead of letting the IRS hold on to it? And that's really what cost segregation does. And it's done through an engineering based study where we come in when you bought that fourplex and you're not just buying the, the walls and the land. You also bought some carpet, some appliances, some countertops, some cabinets. You just don't know the value of those because you paid right. one lump sum. And so that's what cost segregation is, is we're coming in and segregating the cost into different buckets. Right. And so we've got five-year assets, seven-year assets, and 15-year assets that you can depreciate much sooner, which allows you to front load those depreciation expenses versus taking your standard 127 over the next you know, 27 and a half years. And that's where you know the, the logic behind it, which... I know the IRS and logic and Congress, all that mixes together very, very rarely. But, you know, in apartments, I mean, you're replacing carpet every five to seven years. You're repainting every five to seven years. You're you're redoing the parking lot, at least some sort of parking lot maintenance every year, you know, or every, sorry, every five years, you know. So there's real expenses that are there. And while you get to write off the expense, you have an asset that is devaluing every year because you're using it. Right? right. You're using up the useful life of the carpet that you bought at the beginning. Right. And so in five years, when you replace it, you've taken that depreciation when and where it should have been taken. And that's one thing that I think cost segregation Congress got right was because your your roof will last 27 and a half years, but your carpet sure won't. Right. Exactly. And that's really what it came down to is there, there's a there's a depreciation book that has a depreciable or a useful life for just about everything you can think of in business. And carpet is in there and it says carpet lasts five years. The problem is, is that when I buy an existing building, I don't know the value of the carpet that's in there. And so I can't depreciate that carpet. So what ends up happening is that whole building gets depreciated over 27 and a half years, when in fact, it should have all these different components to it that get depreciated over the right schedule. Yeah. So what we do, it's kind of interesting. When we do cost segregation, there's a form we fill out on some of our projects. It's a 3115 that tells the IRS, I've been doing it wrong. I'm now going to fix it and do it right and depreciate it over five years. I'm going from an impermissible method of depreciation to a permissible method. And here's the difference in those numbers and you get huge write-offs by doing so. And guys, I just wanna highlight a couple of things that Eric just said. You're admitting to the IRS that you did something wrong. I would make sure that you have a professional make that admission for you. It's kind of like going in the police department when you know you've got to say something. You want somebody like Eric telling the IRS the right way to say this so that you've, you've made that admission properly. And now you're going to correct that. Right. So right. what I hear you saying, Eric, is I bought this, this uh, fourplex five years ago and I've been taking it 27 and a half years. I've been divided it up, but I, I could do that now. I don't, ha- it doesn't have to be on something I bought this year. Correct. Yeah. That's, that's a, called a look back study. And that's when that form gets filled out. When you buy something this year and you do cost seg, you don't have to go back and tell the IRS that you were doing it wrong. And I don't want to say you were doing it wrong. You just, you're not doing it by their, by their method that they prefer. They're not going to come tell you you're doing it wrong. Cause if they right. come tell you you're doing it wrong, that right. means you're saving more money. They want right. to hold on to that money. So they're okay with you doing it wrong. So don't, I don't want to scare people and say, Hey, we're going to tell the IRS you've been you know, cheating on your taxes. They're not oh. going to tell you about it. Right. <laughs> they don't want right. to give you those deductions up front. They want to hold on to it because they, they do what they want with that money. So they're going to make it up to you to come and say, hey, we want to accelerate these deductions now. Here's our new deductions. And you get to take those on your current tax return. And in that case, Shannon, you don't even have to amend if you've been doing it. Let's say you bought the property five years ago. That form that we fill out makes it so you don't have to amend any prior year's tax returns, which is great. So now I've come in and I've taken that. I was going to do it, you know, $10,000 a year. What What's the average savings when I do it all at once and I did it up front, I got a $275,000 asset. What percentage of that can I write off in the very first year, typically? Sure. Sure. So under the current tax law, um, and I'll touch on this here in just a second, but there's something called bonus depreciation, which allows you to take those five, seven, and 15-year assets all in the first year. Okay. So before bonus depreciation, like yeah. Before bonus depreciation, you would have to take your five-year assets over five years, so you get you know basically twenty percent each year, seven over seven, fifteen over fifteen. But with bonus depreciation, which is the current tax law, you get to take all of that. So you can on a two hundred seventy-five thousand dollar depreciable basis, 
you're going to get about 30% of that in the first year. So you're going to get about a $78,000 write-off in the first year. So 10,000 versus 78,000. Um, so you can see, you know, if again, if I'm a hundred, if I have a hundred thousand of income, instead of paying tax on 90,000 in scenario A, I'm now paying tax on, you know, 20,000 or $18,000 of income. So huge difference there in, in terms of being able to accelerate those deductions. Yeah. So, so now I've taken those and I can pull all those into one year. What's that normal percentage look like? Is that... Yeah, so so typically it's around 30% and that's 30%. Uh, so kind of quick back of the ma napkin math, take your purchase price, like you mentioned, minus land value times 30%. And that's going to give you your year one deduction. So 27 times three, uh, we're going to be somewhere around a hundred grand that we're going to be able to depreciate the average investor, the average real estate investor that I deal with is usually in that 30% tax category. So sure. of that $100,000 in depreciation, I'm going to get a check back from the IRS for 30,000 bucks. Correct. Yep. Now let's do the math on this, Eric. When I bought this place, $350,000, I put 20% down because I didn't want to have mortgage insurance. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. smart enough to know that. So I put, I put uh, what, $70,000 down. I'm going to get half of that back right. in my first year's tax return in, in, in funds that I was going to pay to the IRS, I'm going to now get that back, which doubles the velocity that I can then go buy another fourplex, right? Sure. Yep. And, and make those things a reality. So the, the thing that is beautiful about this is I'm, I'm really, and, and this is what a lot of people fail to see, a tax benefit is really the IRS writing you a check. You know, a lot of people go, well, that's just less taxes I have to pay, but I still have to pay. But if you did what the IRS told you to do, you put it away in quarterly, just uh, quarterly payments. So it's sitting here in an account. It's actually, look at it as a check back to you. You're getting a right. check back on that $350,000 purchase of $30,000 plus in year one. In year one. It's exact. You're, you're paying them. You hit it on the head. You're paying it out either way. Right. So whether you pay it to the IRS or you take that money and go buy a new fourplex, I mean, which one makes the most sense if we're trying to build, you know, long-term wealth and stuff? Obviously, we want to take those funds, pay down existing debt, or go buy and reinvest it into new properties. And so yeah. either way, you're coming out of pocket for that money at the end of the year. I just want to put my money into a new fourplex versus some exactly. people who want to give it to the IRS. And yeah. so that's, the, and that's I, the real difference. I haven't met that person, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> There's people out there. I'm telling you, they're out there. <laughs> and, and I, yeah, I mean, that, that just comes back to being fearful of the IRS, right. right? Because the logic is truly there. It's written in the tax code. Um, and so, so that's, and that, is that the only tax credit I can do on my new purchase? I take the, the cost segregation and I do the bonus depreciation and then I'm done. And then, then, then that's it. There's no more taxes I can get on that particular purchase. You know, there, there may be. So there's a couple other tax credits that I think real estate investors should be aware of. Um, for residential properties, there's one called the 45L Energy Credit. So that's typically on new construction. So if you were to buy or build a new fourplex, um, actually, you would have to build it. If you bought it from a developer, the developer is the one that's eligible for the credit. But if you were to buy, if you I were to that. develop, I'm in development, yes. talking my language here. <laughs> yes. So if I were to build a new fourplex, I may be eligible for a $2,000 credit per door. So that would be an $8,000. Now, this is a, not a deduction. This is a dollar for dollar tax credit, meaning if my tax bill is 10,000, I build a fourplex, it qualifies, I get an $8,000 credit. My tax bill now is 2,000. Okay, so let's back that up one more step. Sure. I made 40 grand. Sure. My tax bill is 10 grand, okay? I owe them $10,000. My 45L credit makes that a $2,000 payment because it's dollar for dollar against my taxes. Correct. So, yeah. and, and we just did this a uh, uh, couple years ago on a, on a 90 unit apartment complex that we just finished. Uh, and we were able to take uh, almost 400 grand uh, in, uh, or yeah, $360,000, no, $180,000. We were able to take against our tax bills. This was- tax bills, so, yeah. Not against your income, right. against so, your tax bill. That that went toward taxes on almost a million bucks, right? Correct. I mean, yep. that's massive. 
That's yeah. incredibly huge. And the reality is, and this is why I tell people all the time, stop looking at the, at the tax code as a penal code. Right. It's something that is your friend. If you're looking at it going, I can buy a fourplex, I can build a fourplex. There's a reason why you might want to build one, right? Correct. There's a reason why development is there. And that development is, it, the, the IRS is trying to stimulate houses. We're trying right. to stimulate people to build houses because as we know, as we've experienced for the last five years, there's a massive housing shortage. Right. And they've done this so that you will look at how to do that and how to make that work and how to get that done so that at the end of the day, you can participate in helping the IRS reach their goal instead of looking at it going, ah, they're killing me, man. They're, right. and, you know, that's why they keep put, piling on gas tax. They don't want you to use your vehicle. They want you to go to electric, right? That's why they give the incentive right on the ahead. car. There's all these different reasons why, but the 45L is a powerful one. Now, let me ask you this question. While we're on the 45L, when I do a cost segregation study, I've taken depreciation. And when I sell the asset, we all know I have to repay that depreciation. Correct. Right. Do I have to repay the 45L? No, no recapture on that. So. That's why it's a credit. Right, exactly. There is no recapture. So the developer gets it. It's a one-shot deal. We are ready for it. We made great money on it. Now we have taken the bonus depreciation year one. We've taken the 45L tax credit year one. What else is there? Is there anything else we can do? Yeah, so on that particular property from what I'm involved in, no, there is a commercial credit for, for any of your listeners who build commercial properties. And it's similar to the 45L, it's called the 179D. And let me just kind of back up because I, I know I mentioned 45L quickly, but 45L, it's an energy credit. So you have to have your property certified. A third party comes in, identifies whether or not that's more energy efficient than a similar model from a prior year. And if it is, you're eligible for that credit. So the 45L is really for your residential property. Then you've got the 179D deduction. It's not a dollar for dollar tax credit like the 45L. It's a deduction for large commercial buildings. Anything over, um, excuse me, let me back up, for all commercial buildings versus residential. And so on the commercial side, it's a, the 179D is $1.80 per square foot. They actually raised it to $1.88 in 2022. They adjusted it for inflation. So it's $1.88 per square foot. So if you have a 100,000 square foot building, um, you know, you're going to get $180,000 deduction. So that comes off of your income. The nice thing about the 179D is you can actually qualify for a portion of it. So there's three different portions. There's lighting, mechanical, and building envelope. And each of them is approximately 60 cents. So you may not have the best heating and air conditioner, but if your envelope and your lighting is good, you might get $1.20 dollar twenty per square foot. Well, and here's the thing that I've found, Eric, uh, in my experience is that the, uh, the 2018 IBC, which is usually what most people are building under right now, 2018, or maybe we're adopting the 2019 right now, uh, that, that energy code that's in the 2019 IBC is enough. They will right. not give you a permit in most areas. Most jurisdictions will not allow a permit to be issued unless you're meeting standards that are uh, below what you need to get the 179 or the 45 L, right? So, so yeah, that's one of those absolutely fantastic things that you can use. Uh, obviously, you're getting more bang for your buck on the residential side, but then again, we need more residential housing out there than we do need commercial space. We need both. Yeah. But uh, you know, so so that's fantastic, and those are those are. So, so those are complicated things. Those are not something where I can just sit there and go, well, you know, carpet replacement would be 12,000 bucks. So I'm going to call it 12,000. I mean, what's the science that goes into the cost segregation study? I mean, how do you, as a, as a cost segregator, actually come up with those? I mean, you're not just going, well, typically it's this or it's that. I mean, what, what is your real formula there? Sure. So what we do, if someone were to engage us, we always will provide them a benefit analysis beforehand to say, hey, we're going we're gonna to look at your property before you ever sign anything with us. We're going to save you X amount of dollars at a minimum. Once we are engaged to do the study, we'll actually go out and look at the building. So we, will, we go out, we look at what type of assets are in the building. Does it have carpet or does it have hardwood floors? Because those are two different types of asset. Hardwood flooring gets depreciated over 27 and a half years. Carpet or LVP gets depreciated over five. So we need to go out and identify all the different components. 
when we're doing new construction, we obviously have the um, breakout from the contractor. Those are a little bit easier for us to do, but we're not just, what gets misunderstood, I think, is it's, well, I can, I can look at a general contractor's pay app and say, okay, well, I see flooring on here for 10 grand, so I'm going to just take 10 grand and depreciate it over five years. What gets missed is, I'll give you an example. If you have, let's look, let's look at a warehouse. Well, actually, let's look at an apartment building. Um, so if you have an apartment building, you don't just get to depreciate the appliances over five years because appliances are five-year assets. You also get to take parts of the plumbing that go to your laundry room, portions of the electrical that go to your laundry room. The only reason you have electrical and plumbing into a laundry room is specific for that five-year washer and dryer. So we look at it and we actually get to allocate portions of the plumbing and portions of the electrical costs back to that five-year asset. Not only that, so you have that portion, but then you also have all the indirect costs that go into building a building. So when you build a building, you have construction interest, you've got architectural fees, you've got permitting. We get to take portions of all those indirect costs and apply that back to that washer and dryer. So it's not just as easy as going and saying, hey, I bought a washer for 500 bucks. I'm going to put it on the books as 500 bucks. No, it's when you buy a building, there's all these different components that you need to look at. And so we've got software that we use, costing software, kind of like construction software that estimates the cost of these different things. And we do some modeling on our end once we've seen the building or seen the costs to be able to provide a new breakout of those costs and what it costs you individually. So really what you're saying is there's more science to it than just uh, just looking at what it costs to put it that particular thing in it. So you, 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 you guys really honestly need a professional to do this. I mean, you can't really get the benefit of it, nor uh, th this is the other thing too. I mean, the IRS understands and knows what you're doing and what you're trained to do. They also know that I don't know that. And so when I turn in mine, uh, complete in crayon, I filled out, <laughs> you know, uh, they, they, they know. They might question that. They, they, that's they, a, that's like a great point, cook. Shannon, I want to just touch on because it is a science. So you would think it's, you would think that if you went to two different cost state companies, you would get the same results. And the answer is no, it's very different. And the reason is, it's just the same reason you would go to two different CPAs with your tax return and you're going to owe two different amounts. Now, the IRS is on to cost segregation. Cost segregation has been around. They just updated the IRS audit guide. So they give their agents a guide that says, here's how you need to review these studies. And they just updated it for the first time in seven years with any major changes for the first time in 15 years. And in that audit guide, it points to people like you who file in CRAN and it says, you need to scrutinize the hell out of these reports. So there's a- So there's, so there's another tip guys, don't do your taxes in CRAN, okay? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so it actually says, there's a, there's a methodology of rule of, they call it rule of thumb in doing these cost sake studies, which is, which is basically just taking averages and says on average, a residential property, you know, we can segregate 30%. Okay. There's companies out there called do-it-yourself cost seg. I think their website actually might be DYI cost seg or something to that effect where you actually as a, an investor go in and put your own information into that. The IRS has determined that those are very, they need to be scrutinized for, for obvious reasons. Right. And so, so yeah. Just, just like you wouldn't do your own kidney transplant, guys. I mean, there's certain <laughs> things you want a specialist for. I mean, you could, right? Or you could save some other money and you could go to the vet and get it done. But <laughs> so let's talk about costs for a minute because that's really what it boils down to, right? You, we, we understand that you're going to be able to save some coin, but it's always baffling to me, Eric, how often people then get cheap on who they use to save money, right? Right. I mean, this coupon's only good for 35% off, uh, but you got to buy two type of a thing. It's like, wait a minute. So, and I know that every deal is different. I know that things have sure. different levels of complexity, but but I'm sure that by and large, when you guys do a fourplex or a, or a small 350, 400, $500,000 investment, you know, what does something like that typically cost? If we know we already did the numbers and we're going to save about... Ten thousand dollars, right? We we said we were gonna no, we we're gonna save about thirty thousand dollars on the on the three hundred fifty thousand dollar fourplex. We're gonna save that up front. What's our cost for something like that? Sure. So that's a great question. So the cost range, and I'll give you kind of a wide range because it does it is based on size and scope of each project. So a fourplex is a little easier for us to do than a retail strip mall. Yep. But we've got to get into nine different tenant spaces. But 
usually on a three hundred thousand dollar fourplex, you're probably in the two to three thousand dollar range for the study. Um, and then we've done we do everything from single family homes up to ski resorts that are forty thousand dollars for a study because there's you know fifteen buildings right. at the ski resort. We got to ski here all season. We got to check out all the lifts. We got to make right. you know how much yes. deforesting needs to happen on this run. I mean, you know, we'll let yes. you know in March. <laughs> So I know that's a wide range. Our average study at our firm is between six and eight thousand dollars. But for your smaller residential stuff, you're between two and thou two and three thousand, and you're going to save at least with this bonus depreciation right now at least ten x on that. Yeah. Um, so that's what I was getting ready to kind of drill into. So it's probably going to cost you ten percent of your savings. Yes. Right. So if you're going to save thirty, you're going to pay three. That seems like a pretty good deal. Uh, it's not one of those things that we're going to save you thirty thousand dollars for a, a nice nominal fee of twenty seven nine ninety five, right? No. Uh, so. And so that's something you want to look at, though, because you hit it on the head. You don't want to go cheap in this. I've seen people step over. Let me get this right. Step over a dollar to save a penny. Yeah. Where they said they looked at my proposal versus a competitor's proposal and says, Eric, you're two thousand dollars more than than this person over here. And I said, okay, that's fine. I said, I don't want to be the cheapest in our industry. We do better work. Let me look at that proposal. And when I looked at the proposal, the, the competitor was saying that they were going to save you $20,000. i am saying that I'm going to save you $30,000. That's a $10,000 difference. My fee is $2,000 more. You do the math. You're still coming out eight grand ahead. And so I don't want to... I don't want, I don't, how's it, you, get, you can't leave me hanging. How's the story end? Did they get it or did they do their math and go with the other guy? No. They, they came with, they did their study with us, but. Okay. Thank I, God. Because I have known people that did the math and went with the other guy. <laughs> there are people I've had in that example, that example, they did come with us. I have had people do go with the other people because they're like, you know what? I'm going to save my money up front. I don't know that you're going to get those amounts. And so I just, I don't say that to self-promote our company no. or anything, but when I say this, it's very, there's no two proposals that are the same. And you need to look at just, not just cost, but look at what the return is going to be. And then from there, it is a simple math equation. Okay. They're saving me 30. They're charging three. This guy's saving me 20, charging me two. do the math and go with whoever it is, whether it's yep. us or somebody else, it doesn't matter. Yep. But. No, I totally get it. And that's, that's always, uh, you know, something that some people uh, look at or don't look at, but then th again, that's why the dollar stores are here. That's why, you know, there's Hyundai and Mercedes, right? Some people right. see the value in it and some people don't. Right. right? Uh, so, and, and th there's nothing wrong with that, uh, except when it boils down to black and white numbers, then there really is something wrong with that. That's, that's sure. the common <laughs> core math, right? Right. Uh, so, but you know, Eric, I mean, so I mean, we've we've you've told us about the, the the ways that we can save money and and how we can get these costs down. What are some of the other things that that you know are my my listeners will want to know? I mean, you know, what, what what's something else that they can learn here from the cost segregation world? Sure. So I, I always like to just touch on when you sell an asset, and you kind of mentioned it in in one of your questions about recapture, and so I always like to just point this out because I think this is probably the biggest area where I see CPAs and building owners where their hesitation is on cost segregation. So when you sell an asset, you pay two types of tax. You pay capital gains tax and you pay a recapture tax. Your recapture tax is calculated based on the amount of depreciation you've taken. So we'll meet with, even CPAs we'll meet with and they say, I don't advise cost segregation because if my client takes all that depreciation today, when they sell their building in five years, they have a huge tax bill to pay in five years, right, Eric? And I say, well, not exactly right. So let me just walk through a quick scenario. I'll try and clear this up as clearly as I can without getting too far in the weeds, but I'll kind of back into it, Shannon. If you don't do cost segregation and you buy a building for a million dollars today and you sell it for 2 million in five years, when you go to settle up with the IRS on that transaction, you're telling them that everything doubled in value. My land is worth double. My walls are worth double. And guess what? So is my dirty old carpet that's now five years old. It just went double. It's double the value when I sold it. Carpet doesn't go up in value. Carpet goes down in value. But right. if you don't do a cost segregation study, you don't have that carpet broken out. So you're just taking one big lump sum of asset and saying this asset doubled in value. When you do cost segregation, you can pull out bits and pieces. So what is your five-year carpet worth after owning the building for five years? Nothing. Nothing. It's got zero book value. You pay no recapture on that if you do a cost seg study. 
So the whole idea behind cost segregation is take your deduction today at the highest rate, at my ordinary income rate. I'm gonna take my deduction against my 37% tax rate. I'm going to pay back a portion of it. That portion is dependent upon how long I own it. I'm going to pay back a portion of it at a 20% capital gain rate and save the spread. Right. Even if I pay it all back, I'm saving a 17% spread. But guess what? I'm not paying it all back because my five-year carpet after five years is worth zero. Right. And so that's where I just want to, I just want to make that point. And yeah. if, if that doesn't, if that doesn't make sense, just let me simplify that. Don't sell your carpet for more than you bought it for. Right. And if you're not doing cost segregation, that's what you're unintentionally doing is you're selling your carpet for right. more than you bought it for. Yeah, no. And that, and that, and that's really true because, you know, people aren't realizing that the profits are one thing and cost of operation are another. And then you have the depreciation that goes with that, you know, and, sure. One of the things too, Eric, that that people, if they didn't pick up on it, I want to reiterate it now, and we're we're going to offer this to all of our listeners. You can you can give me a a a, a preliminary number, and and I can I can tell you, hey, this is what I bought, this is what it is, this is the value, this is the pictures, and I can get a cost segregation estimate with the cost of what that is from you for free. Correct. I can get that. So guys, if you go to contact Shannon Robnet or you go to shannonrobnet.com forward slash contact, you can reach out to us. We will send you that uh, link that you can go directly to Eric and get that. So you guys, if you just reach out and contact us, we will get you connected with Eric and you can get that for free. So then you can have the benefit of knowing what it's going to likely save you this is where we flash that uh, warning, uh, you know, actual results may differ, but you're going to know very closely. And guys, this is somebody that's been doing this in, in, in the industry for 16 years. The company has been, they've had a lot of results that they know what they're talking about and they know how to get close there. And Eric, I'm going to guess, not to put you guys on the spot, but I'm going to guess that you guys overpromise and underdeliver, or do you underpromise and overdeliver? Underpromise and overdeliver? Under, I always have to think twice yeah, because I get, my tongue gets twisted. We under promise and over deliver. Every time we do our analysis, I've been, like I said, six years I've been doing this. We haven't not hit our numbers once because we're super conservative on our estimates because, yeah. you know, if I tell you I'm going to save you 40 and charge you four, you're probably going to move forward with it. And so if I end up saving you 50, kudos to us, right? I mean, right. so it's, but save never me want to we got a problem. Right. right. It's so funny how the public, I mean, the, I'm like that, you know, you right. said 40, Eric, and I got 39,997. What's wrong with you guys? You know, right. I mean, I overpaid. You said, you said, you know, so, so guys, that's what we have for you guys today. When you're, when you're looking for that and you want to know more, if you, and if you want to know more about cost segregation and how we employ it in our business, I can call me, I can give you some real world examples. I can give you actual deals we've done which Eric can't actually do because he probably doesn't have the permission from the people to give you their numbers on, the, you know, sure. but you can contact me um, and we can talk about actual deals we did. And then we can connect you with Eric and you can get your free cost seg study estimate and then get moving on it. Anything else we need to, I mean, I think we've, we've barraged them with a massive amount of information. And especially when you're talking about cost savings uh, on your taxes. I mean, that's the number one thing in the world that everybody's trying to pay less of, right? Yeah, no, you, you hit it on the head. So no, I think we've covered a lot. Um, it's been great. Thanks. You've been, asked some great questions. Hopefully we've been able to provide some value to your team. Oh, definitely, Eric. Definitely. So guys, uh, thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Real Estate Rundown. Uh, as always, uh, you know, subscribe, like, share with your friends. And if you've got other questions, connect at shannonrobnet.com. Uh, and we would love to connect with you and help you out on your real estate journey. Thanks again, Eric, for being on the show. All right. Have a good one. All right, we'll talk soon. That's a wrap for today's episode of The Real Estate Rundown. Let these newfound strategies pave the way to start a successful career or a profound rebranding. If you loved everything you have heard, listen to more conversations at www.shannonrobnet.com. And be sure to leave a rating, share it with your friends, and subscribe. Until the next episode.